we're going to go next every time we move a slide because I don't have the control. So if we go to the first slide, Prusa. Thanks. Thanks. So um, the first slide. So uh, yes, as um, Prusa was saying, TCL is the name of the three founding directors, uh, Kevin, the belated Kevin Taylor, who was also my husband. Uh, we started the firm together in 1990, and then we were very fortuitous that Perry Lethleen came along. He's the guy on the um, on the other side um, of Kevin. Kevin's the one in the middle. Uh, and my mum always says that he looks like Doctor Who in that shot. Uh, so um, Kevin, so so the reason I showed this is because I suppose from the very beginning we were all about collaboration. So I, I have a background in biological sciences. I majored in botany at UWA, then uh, became a high school teacher for a few minutes. Then I uh, studied film making, and then I studied uh, visual arts. Uh, Kevin. Uh, his first degree was in architecture and then he did landscape architecture. Uh, Perry's was in landscape architecture and then he did a Masters of Urban Design. So we all shared a, a background of study in landscape architecture and I think the reason why our, the our body of our work is so eclectic is because it brings all, all those disciplines and more. And as um, Justin was saying, collaboration is a really important part of what we do. So if we go to the next slide, we also, next, uh, we also work in a studio, uh, studios uh, in Adelaide and Melbourne. Uh, we have about 30 people working with wonderful people who we uh, collaborate with on a daily basis. Next. Next. So what I'm going to, um, I'm going to mention a couple of projects today, but I thought it would be good to start with where you are. And all through the talk, I'm going to pepper it with uh, quotes mainly from writers really, we get very inspired by the written word and the poetics of language. And I think as students, the poetics of language is a really important tool for you for expressing projects to, to others. So we're very taken with the West Australian Tim Winton's uh, work. So Australians are surrounded by ocean and ambushed from behind by desert, a war of mystery on two fronts. And he also talks about West Australians as living in the teeth of the wind. I think that's a fantastic way of describing the, the really wild winds that you get in Perth. It's, it's one of the windiest cities of the, in the world. And I always get really surprised when I come back to Perth, living there as a child, how windy it really is. So the next slide. And also one of the most isolated cities in the world. So, so I think it, it's also... Uh, an incredibly dry continent. It's not the driest continent. The driest continent, strangely enough, is Antarctica. And um, I live in Adelaide now, which is the driest city in Australia. And uh, we have about 550 millimetres of rain per year. Uh, Perth, surprisingly, has a lot more. It has about 850. And surprisingly, it has more rain than London, which has about 580 which is, was a real surprise to me. But when you look at that map, you see how incredibly dry most of the continent is and why we cling to the edges of the continental shelf. We cling to the edges, or as Philip Drew, the great uh, architectural writer says, we, we live on the veranda of Australia. Next. So, um, you live in what is one of the world's most amazing global biodiversity hotspots. So that what that means is that it that the southwest of Western Australia has uh, an enormous number of species of plants and animals within a relatively small area. So, for example, southwest of Western Australia is the size of England. England has 1,500 vascular plants. They're, they're, well, let's just say they're most of the plants around except for fungi and algae and, um, and a few other microscopic plants. And only 47 of those plants are found nowhere else. Whereas in the southwest of Western Australia, of which Perth is um, within, 
there's 7,239 species and almost 80% of them are found nowhere else. So next slide. So when designing in your hometown or where you're studying now, it's really important to remember this really incredibly wondrous and magnificent landscape. And what's amazing about it is that these, these plants are really adapting to adversity. So uh, Perth and Australia on the whole has some of the most ancient soils in the world. So they're incredibly depleted. So go to the next slide. Next, yeah. Can you see my finger, Parissa? I'm just wondering if I go like that, if it's easier. Uh, no. No. Okay, I'll just go next. So this is Kings Park, which was my playground when I was a child. So what's amazing about West Australian plants is that they have adapted to these incredibly impoverished soils with a myriad of wondrous ways of collecting nectar and attracting birds or um, their leaf shapes are really suited to the dry or the harsh environment and the winds. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about what we call the threads or the themes that inform our TCL's work. One of them, which relates to poetics, is about narrative. We really mine a, a, a site and a project and a brief to really distill down what's the essence of what we're trying to communicate. So this image here is the forest gallery. So the forest gallery is in the Melbourne Museum and it tells stories of the tall timber forests just outside Melbourne. And these are the forests that were so devastatingly burnt in 2009. So if you ever wanted to see this project, it's within an atrium about the size of a swimming pool, 50 by 25 metres, and it's within the Melbourne Museum. If we go to the next slide. So the next now, uh, thread that we're really interested in is um, material presence. So uh, looking at landscapes as found, so really being inspired by what is there and using what's there. And then in a more urban sense of artifice, how we create something from a really eclectic um, and manufactured palette of materials. Next. We're very interested in the civic condition. We do quite a lot of pro large scale projects in cities. We're really interested in, a, in an idea uh, that a historian put forward to us and also, uh, and you might be interested in this social geographer, Richard Sennett, this idea about new civic, about how in the public realm, we're, not, we're trying to let diverse voices speak and how rather than having one element and then another element and everything being very tidy, that there's urban friction between the people who experience those, those environments and also the way in which they're constructed. And um, I put this as an example of the Auckland waterfront where rather than erasing the original condition of the site, we wanted to keep the working wharf as it was rather than making it an artificial waterfront. So the paving stay, the railway tracks, the silos, we, um, the harbour stay, the smelly fishing market, the fishing fleets, everything stayed there and then we added more elements to create this urban friction. Next. And then site. So we've been very fortunate to work in a lot of national parks within Australia and that idea in those instances of infrastructure and elements becoming almost invisible. So this project's a walking trail that's on an escarpment. So when you're walking on the other side of the escarpment, you can hardly see that lookout. Uh, and I'm going to show you some, um, some work from the Uluru Aboriginal Cultural Centre, which really works with, um, uh, was, our, was the first project where we worked with um, what is one of the most powerful sites um, I've ever experienced in the world. Uh, next. So the last thread is collaboration. 
from the very go, very beginning, we worked out and we worked from home. It was really interesting having a lot of people sitting around our breakfast table and um, people from a lot of different disciplines. I mean, the usual, the usual crowd of artists, um, architects, other designers, but we're really interested in talking to historians, scientists, uh, poets, uh, filmmakers. Uh, they all add something different to the field of landscape architecture, which we call the expanding field, which is a notion that is very interesting for architecture as well. So if you're interested in that idea, a woman called Rosalind Krauss an art critic first coined that word in relation to environmental art. So that might be something you might be interested in exploring further. Uh, next. Uh, and this is um, a work that we did with TZG, Tonkin Zalika Greer. And um, I just said goodbye to Brian Zalika this morning. Um, they, he and his wife, uh, Janet Lawrence, who's an artist, were also on this holiday. I'm in Kangaroo Island at the moment. And um, so a lot of our collaborators become good friends. Uh, so next one. So what I'm going to do now is show you a number of projects. I'm not sure if we'll get time to go through them all, but we'll see how we go. And Parissa, when you think the time's up, just maybe, can you just tell me there's another 10 minutes? Um, Okay, so the first project I'm going to talk about is um, Uluru. So Uluru Aboriginal Cultural Centre, which we did a long time ago now, um, actually probably before some of you were born, in 1990. It was some... Um, okay. Sorry for interruption. Yep. I was muted. I couldn't... Um, I'm sharing my screen, oh, so I couldn't okay. share myself on. But for sure, I'll give you... Heads up when it is um, basically 10 minutes to um, maybe quarter to 12. Is that okay? Quarter to, uh, sorry, so I'm two, 11, hour, I'm two and a half. Perhaps 11.35, uh, if that's okay. And then we can um, start. The I'm, I'm, I'm two hours behind, I'm two and a half hours behind you. So oh. at the moment, I'm 10 to 2. So In what time do you want minutes. me? Is that oh, okay? 15 minutes going to stop oh gosh okay sure or 20 yep. minutes that's okay you still have time in 20 minutes okay um, we'll, we'll go really quickly the slides. Okay. Yep. no worries i'll okay. share my screen again i make myself mute sure okay so if we go to the first project which is uluru aboriginal cultural center so we did this work with Gregory Burgess in um, 1990. We went up to Uluru uh, and uh, lived within the community, the Murujulu community of Ananu. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. And if you could play um, the video. And while this is playing, I actually get pretty emotional talking about this project uh, because it had an incredibly profound effect on me. Um, so I often get a bit teary, so we'll see how we go. So um, if you just um, play that. Maybe we'll go to the next slide because maybe we don't have time. It was just some music, so that's okay. Um, just give me a second, please. Oh. So edit, yeah. reference. I've received some um, instruction from Danielle, but I can see preferences, 3D. Oh, okay. Um, I don't think I can play it, sorry. No, that's fine. That's okay. So the reason it's as found, so um, often when I give talks overseas, I show this map to show the, the number of lang Aboriginal uh, language groups in Australia. And I think it's quite an interesting way to navigate our way around Australia. So next. So um, this amazing monolith in the in the middle of Australia. So uh, we the, the the brief was to design 
a cultural centre for Aboriginal people so that Aboriginal people had control over the narrative, which is Uluru and the, and the surrounding landscapes and the Jukupa, the dream, their, their uh, law, their stories, and that they could invite visitors and, and do it on their terms so that they were the host and the tourists were the visitors. Next. So before that, it had been that idea that you come to a wondrous place and you make it look like somewhere else, which was the opposite of what we wanted to do. Next. And the other thing was to discourage people walking up the um, up Uluru. Uh, the Ananu call them Minga, which means ants, and they get very upset when no, every week somebody would have a heart attack trying to climb up the rock and they feel responsible for it. So it's really amazing that it took so long for the rock, for the climb to, uh, to be closed and it really is a very powerful statement from, from Ananu. Next. So there was posters like that around at the time. Next. Or T-shirts. So this was an ad... Of a of a nearby resort at the little township, 20 kilometres away from the from Uluru, um, is Rock Resort, saying being in the middle of the desert is nothing like being in the middle of the desert. Uh, we believed that being in the middle of the desert was to be everything about being in that space. Next. So this is an image on, on, yeah, so we'll just go to this one. So we worked very closely. We collaborated with Gregory Burgess, a really amazing architect we've worked with a lot and also a really good friend. He was our best man at our wedding. Um, so it was to to give people an understanding of Ananu's connection to land, to one another and to their jukapa, their, their dreaming stories. So because we don't have a lot of time, I might just go through the building and the landscape. So we spent a lot of time looking for a site. Ananu wanted the site to be around a dead tree, of all things, because it is those dead large uh, desert oaks, she oaks, which are casuarinas, that then have this proliferation of new growth. So they saw it as a symbol for reconciliation. And after doing a lot of um, consultation with Ananu, uh, Greg worked on this idea of the two warring uh, serpents that is the dreaming story of the creation of Uluru. So that's how the buildings, uh, an abstraction of that story is in the um, design of the buildings. Next. So we also, next, just go through these until we get, until I tell you to stop. So we were really lucky to see it rain there, the tracks in the sand. We'll just have to go through these pretty quickly, I think, um, Parissa. Talk, spend a lot of time talking to the women about the plants. They decided next, just keep going till I say stop actually, please, thanks. Um, so just stop on that one maybe. So the, the desert oaks, they, they, first of all, they're like what's called Lero warriors. Lero is one of, one of the snakes and uh, they're like spears and uh, they stay like that for about 25 years until they find water and then they branch out into what the, they look like on the other side there. Next. Next. We'll, we'll skip that. We'll skip that. We'll skip that. Okay, this is um, a drawing by um, Kevin, I think, working with the men about the stories around the rock. Next. Uh, this is a um, this is a site analysis where we did some drawings and Kevin wrote some prose, but I won't read that out now because I don't think there's time. Next. Uh, we did a lot of walking on the site. Next. Uh, making models and then uh, we didn't. We had formal meetings, but nobody turned up. So we ended up just having this room where we put up a lot of drawings, we put up a lot of photographs, we made models, and and Ananu, the the Aboriginal people, just came in and they just start talking. And it was an amazing experience um, in many ways. And one of them was that English was for some of them they didn't speak English, so 
uh, being in Australia and, and talking through a translator was, was a really amazing experience. Next. Uh, this is a drawing done by Nellie Patterson, one of the elders, and it's this idea about Ananu, the rangers and ourselves coming together and she cupped her hands and that's a symbol of the way she wanted this project to proceed in a very collaborative um, spirit of reconciliation. Next. Uh, we commissioned some drawings by artists um, and that's the first dot painting I think of a car park up on the top there. Next. The next one is the, um, the, the serpents, Liru and Kunia um, and the creation of the rock. Next. So this is a plan. So um, a lot of tourists come to, un, to come to um, Uluru and many of them didn't get out of their air-conditioned buses or air-conditioned hotels unless they were doing that ridiculous conquering quest of walking up Uluru. So what Adonu wanted is they wanted tourists and visitors to walk through the landscape and experience the wonder of the landscape, not only not only the rock but the minutia of the landscape. So to that end, rather than letting the buses and the cars go right next to the building, we pulled the car parks and the buses right back. The car parks are pulled back 300 metres and the buses 150 metres and then there's all these serpentine paths so that people actually had to walk through the desert in order to get to the um, cultural centre. Next. Because for many people that was the only experience they had of walking through the desert. That's a dead desert oak that the building is surrounding and these very beautiful fluid forms that Greg designed. Next. He'd be a great person to get to talk. Uh, next. So this is the uh, visitors walking through the landscape. So we removed very little vegetation to make these paths out of desert sand. So no trees were removed, no, um, only very little vegetation where the paths were and people were kept to the paths by placing sticks and, um, and branches on the sides of these sinuous paths. Next. So beautiful spin effects, there's a gorgeous desert oak, next. Uh, making um, walls out of sight sand, next. Uh, and then regeneration, the, the, the building um, the, the, the building envelope, the builders had to, were not allowed to damage anything beyond a metre of the building site and they didn't, which was remarkable. Uh, next. Okay, so the next one I was going to show is the Australian Garden. We were very lucky to win, win a, um, a commission to design a 126 hectare botanic garden dedicated to the wonder and the stories, the cultural and environmental stories of the Australian landscape. So I've called this section abstracted because the brief was to create a sculptural landscape rather than a, a landscape of recreating ecosystems. Next. So it's about an hour out of Melbourne. Next, in a place called Cranbourne. It was opened, first stage was opened in 2006, second stage in 2012. Next. Uh, we did this in collaboration and in fact it's the Australian Garden TCL with Paul Thompson. Paul Thompson is remarkable. He has an encyclopedic knowledge of Australian plants. Anybody interested in Australian plants, that book there is a must. And he also is a true artist. His planting compositions are, are in, incredibly creative and um, nuanced. Next. We love Paul, we love working with Paul. So uh, the site was a former sand quarry surrounded by quite pristine indigenous remnant vegetation. So the bit you see there in the middle um, was the site, the 126 hectares. When we got the commission they'd made these this, these water bodies, which we weren't too keen on. We didn't think they expressed the Australian landscape very well. So uh, not only did we ask them to fill them in, but we then replaced it um, 
with, um, with a desert landscape next. So just go through these slides until I say to stop, please, Parissa. Uh, so some of the amazing vegetation that is found within the Australian landscape, wonderful kangaroo paws from WA. Um, I'm on Kangaroo Island at the moment and from the because of the fires, all the tree grasses, the anthereas, have um, produce these amazing flower spikes and some of them are up to eight metres high. Also the Australian landscape makes an interesting noise. Can you just leave it on that one for a minute? George Seddon, who if you're interested in, um, in the Swan River and the history of the Swan River, I got this from um, reading that book. He was a polymath and he was from Western Australia. He writes that we need to learn to see our own land and forgive it for not being England, so not being green and pastoral. Next. So it was a relatively blank site. Next. It had a lot of uh, programs and, um, and requirements we had to fulfil within the brief. Next. Uh, we we felt that we wanted to talk about a number of things and one of them was this idea, and I've mentioned it, about how we all cling to the precipitous edge of Australia and how the edge is more fertile, immersive, urban and for many Australians more recognisable, whereas the centre is dry, confronting, distant and very striking. Next. So we felt that our primary narrative was about the journey of water and we used this as a principal orientation and, and spatially, a way of spatially defining different spaces within the garden. Next. So uh, the Visitor Centre, which was done by a great Melbourne architect, Kirsten Thompson. So we um, ordered the first stage, which was more about dry and desert landscapes nearer the visitor centre and then the more immersive, urban, fertile landscapes of the continental edge further away on the site as a second stage next. And then we sort of placed some ordering marks throughout the landscape so that, so that it was possible to see that this was had the human hand, it, that it was a very designed and abstracted landscape. Next. That's the site. So it's pretty uninspiring really there. So as I've just said before, the design was through abstraction. Next, If you just go to the next slide, I'll kind of explain it as we're going. Through abstraction, distillation, just keep it on that one maybe. Abstraction, distillation, sculpturing, repetition and patterning and you can see there on the top of the page what we call a sand garden and then it moves and there's very little water there and as it moves down the site it becomes a more watery environment. Next and you can see the very beautiful pristine um, remnant landscape around it. Go to the next slide. So that's looking at it from another angle and you can see there the abstraction and the patterning and the distillation that we, all of these forms have been inspired by the natural landscape and our cultural, the, the cultural eye with which we see it. So we wanted to, to explore this idea about a design approach that communicates landscape, landscape and cultural narratives via experience and immersion rather than what we call didactic ways. This means that and didactic signage. And that's um, principally looking at the sand garden next. So we're very inspired by a number of painters, this sort of lack of focal point that often Australian modernist uh, painters talk about. Fred Williams is one of them. Next slide. Uh, John Olson. This dot dash way of expressing the Australian landscape. So uh, this idea, next slide. This idea that in dry and desert landscapes, every plant sits in its own shadow. Next. 
and you have to weave your way around those 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 elements. You can't walk in a straight line. Next. There are some ordering marks made by um, by human intervention. That's a cattle run. Next. So this first garden I'm going to show is the sand garden. So it's an evocation of dry and desert landscapes in Australia. And we wanted it to, we were very inspired by the principles of Japanese design, where it's quite a reverential landscape. So people don't walk in it. It's more about looking at that landscape and contemplating it and realise that although it's vast and immense, it's actually incredibly fragile because it's on very depleted soils. So um, the, um, the line down the middle is an expression of the navigational device of the compass of looking north and in the foreground is an installation, a permanent installation done by sculptors um, Mark Steiner, Edwina Kearney, it was called Ephemeral Lakes. So the plant forms are expressing the circular forms of spin effects that you get in a desert landscape. Next. So it has this um, a, a, an element, a, a way of looking at landscape that I'm very interested in called the sublime. The sublime came out of the romantics, this idea of grandeur, awe and vastness, but also the fear of a landscape and how it's very interesting how Australians have a real love-hate relationship with the desert. It's wondrous, but we fear it. Next. Uh, these are some lunette forms, which are abstracted lunettes, which are found in some desert landscapes, and then the and then they they provide a, a protection for plantings um, behind them. Next, uh, Kirsten Thompson's building. Um, so looking back th at, um, at the visitor centre. Next. Next. So the next space, usually I have a little pointer, we're going down the side that linear water is. So that water starts as a real trickle and then it starts to pulsate and it's expressing the dry uh, creek beds that lace through the drier Australian landscape and they only pulse with water after a heavy rain event. Next. So we were very inspired by the water that came off Uluru. We were very lucky to see a rain event at Uluru and we saw we could then understand how that, that rock was sculpted by the intermittent water that falls. Next. So the dry creek beds with their wonderful lacing of um, river red gums. Next. So this is an evocation or, a, or an abstraction of the dry creek beds and we collaborated, um, oh, he's the most wonderful, he, he's died now, um, Robert Woodward, I think Australia's greatest um, water uh, designer. He did the Alamein Fountain in Sydney. Um, so. The, the the square sections of stone in the water are expressing the dry creek bed and this water pulses. It comes down and then it dissipates and then it dries out. And then the escarpment wall, which is done um, in collaboration with a, a wonderful um, sculptor, uh, Greg Clark, who also unfortunately died, but as quite a young man um, just earlier this year. Uh, and um, next, so that's looking back up the waterway, next. And you can see here, this is the water's less water, the water's dissipating, it's drying out. And, and it all dries out and then it starts again. And the cycle takes about 20 minutes. Uh, this is the opening on a winter's day in 2006. Um, uh, the opening of the Australian Garden actually created a, um, 
a traffic jam, which we were pretty pleased about actually. Which um, and the premier opening um, the garden realised so many people like botanic gardens that he immediately funded the next stage. So if you're ever involved in the project opening, create a traffic jam and you'll get your net, you'll get the project. The next bit. Next. So this is showing some other patterning in the dry section that we call the, the dry creek bed. Next. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail about this. I think I'll leave this section, but it, it's really, if we just go to the next slide, it's really about Paul's amazing abilities at planting. And there's just a few images, slides here, so if you just keep going through till I say stop, about Paul's incredible, if we keep going. This was actually another talk I gave to, to some landscape architects. So if we just go through, just keep going. Keep going. Yeah, this is uh, Paul's amazing, keep going, amazing patterning of landscape. Next. Next. Uh, and now we're going to go into the second part, which is the more immersive, wetter landscapes and the eucalypt walk. This is the eucalypt walk. And if you ever, just can you just go back a slide? Yep. So when you go, if for, for, if, oh, sorry, no, just that one of the shadows, Parissa. Um, I'm, we're incredibly taken with this idea about light and shadow. And I think for me as a landscape architect, but I also think for the, for architects, that light and shadow is one of the most potent ingredients that you can work with and manipulate and illuminate. And if you go outside and stand under a eucalypt tree, you'll see that the light that is shed through a eucalypt is completely distinctive. And that's because Australian plants hold their leaves horizontally to the sun, sorry, vertically to the sun, so the light sheds through. Whereas European trees and um, trees in wetter climates, like Asian climates, they hold their leaves um, uh, horizontally. So even though eucalyptus is really massive, the delicate tracery of these shadows is something that is very um, idiosyncratic to them and is in immensely beautiful. Next. So we dedicate a whole section to the eucalypt called the eucalypt walk. Next. Next. And we're inspired by the squiggly bark gum to create a pathway. Next. 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 And at the end of stage one, the uh, friends group gave us a cake. That's the best award we've ever received. I think it's fantastic. A cake of, um, they did a casserole as well. So um, if we go to the next section, which is stage two. So these is about the larger expanses of water and the continental edge. So if we just go through this, if you just go through these, Parissa, and I'll just talk to them as they go. So Melaleuca Spitz, a garden called the Weird and Wonderful, about the um, peculiar and some of the strange and um, a characterful plants of Australia, the bottle trees. Gondwana, about how we're connected to stories of Gondwana, about the way in which Melaleucas uh, lace along our um, our estuarine environments. There's a lot of beautiful melaleucas in Western Australia, paper barks. So this is an evocation of mel called Melaleuca spitz, which is um, which is about uh, sand sand formations that form in estuaries and waterways. Next, the seaside garden, a garden of climbing plants. Next, uh, these are next. These are gardens that have take-home messages 
um, that are smaller gardens to give people ideas about how to garden in their environs. This is um, a, a page of all the architecture done by a number of architects, BBK, Kirsten Thompson, Gregory Burgess. Next. Um, ways of traversing, this is the lily pad bridge. Next. Next. I think that's it. And um, I don't think I've got time to talk about the um, National Arboretum, other than to say the National Arboretum, we won an international competition to design an Arboretum in Canberra. And the idea that we came up with was a um, hundred forests of a hundred endangered species. And it's been realised and open now since 2013. So, and it was a project that came out of the devastation of the fires in 2003, and it was inspired by what we saw on site. If you just keep going through, Parissa, I'll just talk as you go. Um, and on site, there were two remnant forests, one of cork oaks sorry, and one... Kate, sorry, um, yep, just, just a reminder, we have 12 minutes left, so perhaps oh, we can oh, okay. in three minutes or so. We still have a few minutes for uh, questions. Thank you. Sure. So the two, two, so this is a cork oak forest where they actually cork. So you don't get cork in bottles anymore, but um, they were, they actually strip the bark of the cork. And this is a Himalayan cedar, uh, Himalayan cedars. So we thought we're going to have a hundred forests of a hundred endangered species. We're not going to mix them. To, we're not going to mix the forests together. So in a way, a hundred forests of a hundred endangered species is a strategy and a program, an ongoing event rather than a finished work. So these are some diagrams that we did during. Every forest is arranged in a different way and those arrangements each have a narrative to them and they were done by different people within TCL. So every staff member got a forest to design. So that they were scientific or physical features about the plants or cultural stories. So these are some of the um, these are some of the arrangements. Uh, that's a sculpture sculpture uh, done on one of the knolls, the wide brown land. Next. So if you just keep clicking through, Parissa. Um, so showing the different arrangements of. Uh, so this is just showing one of the arrangements is like a beehive because it was based on um, it was uh, it was based on the idea. Oh no, this one's beautiful actually. This one are she oaks, which you have in Western Australia, uh, Alocasiurina verticillata, and uh, the endangered black uh, glossy black cockatoo. Actually, there's some endangered black cockatoos here on Kangaroo Island where I am right now and they feed on the same casuarinas and they mate for life and they really like hanging around one tree um, and they're incredibly endangered. In Western Australia they're very endangered. Um, I know that they're trying to um, get bigger populations down at Murdoch University. Uh, this is a picnic area in the um, cedar forest that was still there. Next. So this will be a project that will be realised in the next lifetime. But we felt there needed to be something on day one. The building was done by TZG, Tonkins Lake Agria. So we did this big sculptural uh, clearing in the middle. Um, and dignant trees can plant trees. Um, that's once again the opening. A lot of people turned up, which was great. So that there was something from day one this idea of a sculpted landscape. Next. Uh, there's also, uh, this is my favourite bit actually, is a bonsai garden. And uh, the next image is Peter Tonkin, the architect behind a, a bonsai of a Moreton Bay fig, which you have a lot of in Western Australia in Perth. Next. Uh, and this is uh, just finishing off with a playground um, called the Seed Pod Playground, if we just go through all those slides. Uh, it's a little Banksia cubby uh, and um, 
Yeah, we did a little blackboard thinking that the kids would just draw on the blackboard and the end of the day of the opening they're drawn all over every wall. So if we just go to the next slide and just keep it on there for a moment. Thanks. So the National Arboretum's a living project and it doesn't really have a completion date because the trees will keep on growing and evolving. It, it really is about raising a consciousness of endangered species all over the world and the way in which the landscape and trees are incredibly uh, vital and important for the ongoing legacy of the landscape and, 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 and a healthy ecology. And I think it's something that the next generation is really grappling with and, and really taking on. And I think I, um, notions about climate change have really accelerated uh, a general public's desire to have a greater understanding about the, the natural environment. So the National Arboretum with 100 forests of 100 endangered species goes some of the way towards this idea of gaining an understanding about the environment. I think I might stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Um, I just stop my screen sharing and possibly I turn on my video if you can also. Oh, yeah, I have your video. That's great. Um, so really incredible, unique work, Kate. Thank you for um, sharing these amazing uh, projects with us. You can obviously see the translation of sustainability and poetic expression of the landscape and culture. And I think what is quite fascinating about your work is the fact that there is no border. Um, it, it seems that there is no border between what you have designed and the nature. And that is what really makes it um, beautiful. So I just um, check the chat box to see whether people have questions. Um, I haven't monitored that, but um, I can just check now. If anyone has any question and can turn on the mic, please go ahead and ask questions, and then I'll Hi, check um, the chat. Hi, Kate. Uh, Hi. This is Nathaniel Belcher. I'm the head of school. I just wanted to thank you for sharing this amazing work. I have to run to another meeting that, that we're in between, but I, I, it was really great to see. I'm, I'm coming from the U.S., and it's a, it was just an amazing um, sense of the enormity and the expanse of the Australian landscape, so thank you for that. Um, wish you the best, but I have to run. Sure. Thank you, Nat. Anyone else has any question? Um, I th hi, Kate. Hi, Bruce. It's Justin hi. here. In, t in the chat box, um, there are a couple of questions from uh, people. I was just wondering, <clears throat> uh, there's one here, there's a second question from Darcy, which was whether TCL has an integrated or systematized process for engaging with traditional owners or is engagement made on a case by case basis? Um, yeah, that's a interesting. That's a great question. Thank you, Darcy. Um, it, the, uh, uh, well, we've been um, working with um, traditional owners, First Nations people since 1990. And it was on a case by case basis. And, um, but we have more recently um, been compiling uh, some guidelines. So um, a number of years ago, we, um, we, we wanted to ensure that the project memory of the projects that we've worked on with traditional owners wasn't um, wasn't lost about the process. So we have a research arm called Tickle and we produce uh, small booklets to do with different topics. And uh, the latest one is engagement with traditional owners. And what we did there, so we have an informal process at the moment, but we're in the process of making it formal. But making a formal process in a way is a very European construct. Um, so, um, but what we have been doing, we've been following, um, I think we've always followed what is now um, 
a process by the Institute, by the Landscape, Institute of Landscape Architects. Uh, and uh, in the tickle booklet, engagement with traditional owners, TCL staff members that hadn't been involved in projects, certain projects with traditional owners, interviewed staff members that had. And then on one project with a, a traditional owner that we work with a lot in Adelaide, he was interviewed. So we could share that booklet with you, um, and if if you like. And um, this year, um, there's that we said after Kevin died. Kevin died suddenly in um, 2011. We set up the Kevin Taylor Legacy, and every year we. Um, we have a, a, a we provide funds for a creative person. They can be in any field. Um, we've had a filmmaker, a poet, musicians, uh, theatre people, uh, sculptor. Uh, this year we have a traditional owner that we have worked with, and he's doing a body of work that is based around passing on knowledge to the next generation. And it will probably culminate in a film. So if you go to our Instagram, you'll be able to follow that. Uh, but I'll, I'll send the traditional engagement tickle booklet to Parissa and Justin. So suppose to answer your question, we do, but I do think every project is different and every project we learn and in every project we we realize that we we need to listen and that i think is the is the most important ingredient thank you kate um i guess um, unfortunately, we need to wrap up. I have received so many messages that um, we wish the session was longer because everyone um, really enjoyed um, your presentation, Kate. And um, there is a request whether we can have access to the slides from Joshua. Um, you will be able to uh, see the presentations and the recording through architalk org website so i'll just type the website here um, for you and then yes you can have access to the recordings again if um, anybody people do want answers to their questions i'll be in perth next week or i'm happy if you want to have another small session or whatever i'll be happy to answer more questions later but i know that time is tight that's fantastic that's a great opportunity so if anyone is interested um, please let me know and Justin we perhaps can um, coordinate with Kate when she's here uh, and we can have a greater discussion thank you everyone that was wonderful lots of thanks, good comments from people um, and thanks for joining us that was a great um, um, speech we really enjoyed deeply thank you Kate thanks for your time uh, thanks, and, uh, thanks, Justin. Thank you. Oh, thanks. That was brilliant. No was thanks. Bye. Thank you. Oh, no, it's Thank over, you. unfortunately. Oh, it's oh, over. Oh, oh, this is it. Yeah. Everybody else has left. Oh, but it was a nice place. So yeah. Okay. It was a nice place yeah. to give a talk from. Yeah, yeah I've got oh, to get out of this beautiful yeah. house now, unfortunately. Cool. Okay, ciao. ciao. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.